Good morning. My name is David Thompson. I'm pastor at First Lutheran Church of Chickasha, and we're excited that you're joining us for this YouTube condensed service for Pentecost 27. I am just getting over having lost my voice uh, for some sinus issues this whole week, and I pray that it is not a bother or difficult for you to follow this service. I'll do the best I can. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Gracious, righteous, and merciful God, we confess that we often fail to see your sovereignty in our lives and in the world around us. Forgive us, dear Lord, from turning our hearts inward on ourselves. Help us to see and bear witness to your steadfast love for all people, even though we are living through these difficult days and years. Forgive us for shunning your word and failing to cling to your promise for eternal life. Today, we intentionally seek your mercy and grace. The Lord instructs the heart, counsels, and forgives. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our hearts are made glad, our whole being rejoices in the forgiveness of God, amen. Let us pray the collect for the day. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is taken from the letter to the Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 to 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven... There is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, 
for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is found in the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. Glory to you, O Lord. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the movie, The Quick and the Dead, a woman named Ellen, played by Sharon Stone, arrives in the western town of Redemption to avenge the murder of her sheriff father years earlier by the town's vicious overlord, John Herod, played by Gene Hackman. She presents herself as just another stranger competing in the deadly fast draw competition. At one point in the movie, it appears as if she's been killed and John Herod moves on to another victim. But at the end, as if having risen from her grave, Ellen walks toward him out of the smoke that hangs over the street. She is there to kill him, and he can't believe what he sees. You're dead, he cries. But of course she is not. He seems to know that the end is near for him, and so he asks, Who are you? She responds by throwing down the badge of her father, and in his dying moments, John Herod realizes that his past sins were being visited upon him, and there would be no redemption for him. John Herod finally sees who Ellen is, and the realization is frightening. In a way, our text does that for us about Jesus. Maybe you see Jesus as the messenger of bad news in our text. He's not responsible for it. He, as, as we think, he's harmless and, and non-threatening. But that's not true. Jesus is God, the Word made flesh, which goes forth and accomplishes that which God intends, just as it did at creation. So as Jesus describes the cataclysmic events to come, they are not just depictions he sees happening out of his hands, they are pronouncements. He is in control, and things don't happen apart from what he says. They happen through what he says. As the one who will come in judgment next time, Jesus is responsible. And you may not like thinking of him that way, but when you do, as a blood-bought Christian, it will establish security, peace, and thankfulness in your heart. He is responsible for all that scary stuff, like, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Verse 2. That is scary. The very center of your nation's identity and religion demolished. And if that goes, then what about the city? and the people. In the past, Yahweh had lifted his protective hand from over the Jews a number of times because of their sin and idolatry. The destruction of the temple in 70 AD by Titus must occur for very similar reasons. The Messiah came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus warned Jerusalem and its leaders, look, your house is left to you desolate, Matthew 23, verse 38. In other words, God is no longer over there in the temple, but standing right before you. To the Pharisees, he said, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here, Matthew 12, verse 6. But they just wanted to kill him. As long as the temple stood with its daily sacrifices, it would be a distraction from the once-for-all sacrifice God himself made on the cross. Jesus is responsible for all types of calamity. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Such things must happen. But why must they happen? It is inevitable when the sinful heart of mankind wants to take charge, wants to be 
its own idol. The result is this rotten condition of the world we live in. But the end is still not, is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Peoples and rulers will not love their neighbor as themselves. We see that because they will not repent. They will not learn humility and kneel at the cross. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. Well, before Hurricane Katrina even hit the coast, environmental activists were already crying that global warming caused this. But it's not global warming. It's global sin. An entire creation crashing about like one of those houses flying to pieces. There's still more to come because these are only the beginning of birth pains. Verse 7. They are not accidental. Who goes into the delivery room and asks, how did this happen? See, these are what happen when the old must go because the new has come. More specifically, Jesus relates some very personal persecutions because we believe in him. This persecution will come by religious and political groups just so we can witness to them. Despite the clear word of God, families will disintegrate for lack of faith. Brother will betray brother to death and a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All this, Jesus says, is because of me, verse 13. All this is because he is the content of our speech, our way of life, and the prince of this world hates that. Yet we know something that Jesus is responsible for that helps us in such times. He is the one responsible for resolving all that horrible stuff for our good. On the cross, the father was pleased to hand over his own son, plunging him into the darkness of judgment rather than us. It's not a mere messenger being killed. He is being held responsible for all our sin. But God is good to his word, for the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Well, our Savior was faithful to the end, despite the temptations and roadblocks the devil put in his way. And so the Father raised him to victory, glory, power, and majesty. Now, as the writer of Hebrews states, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10, verse 17 and 18. Redemption will not be kept from us because it has been wrought by God. He is the judge, and he has declared you acquitted and free to go, free to live in these disquieting times without fear of having missed the rapture, free from the fear of death or poverty or oppression because he has overcome each of them. God has made a way for us to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Hebrews 10, 19. Who needs a temple? The Holy Spirit has made your body his temple through baptism so that you are in the presence of God wherever you go. We will not lose heart at the rumble of test rockets launched in North Korea or China or the unprecedented indoctrination of our citizens to hate their own country, their skin color, or natural disasters, for they are merely opportunities for Christians to comfort the terrified with the gospel of Jesus. We acknowledge our nation's fiscal cliff, but know that the most precious treasure, God's Son, has already bridged the chasm between sinners and God. We have a place prepared for us. Our names are written in the book, all because Jesus is responsible for saving you and his love stands firm to the end. And what are we to stand firm to the end with. It's not the effective and dynamic growth of Christianity in our nation. That's not happening. Or the moral improvement of our society. No way. Or the powerful free market economy that once brought about the most thriving middle class in history. 
Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, look to Jesus who is responsible for a cornucopia of blessings. Oppression, poverty, persecution, and disappointment cannot take away the word of God and all its promises fulfilled in the past and unfolding even now to be fulfilled in our lives. What a bedrock to face the challenges ahead. Well, Mel Gibson would say, they have taken our savings. They may take our land and they can even take our lives, but they can't take away the means of grace. Think about it. God's word connected to simple elements of water, bread and wine, yet it is the very heart of our freedom and endurance to eternity. Jesus is responsible for your closest friend, your most trusted spouse, and the flock of children and grandchildren that pick your brain about the mysteries of life. Jesus is responsible for the air you breathe and the beating of your heart every hour, minute, second, through all these years. Jesus is responsible for the beauty of music, the intoxication of a kiss, and the thrill when a butterfly lands on a child's finger. And even when friends betray, spouses break their vows, and the children disobey, we have the blessing of forgiveness that restores relationships. When our bodies fail us, our music goes out of style. Butterflies die off from pesticides and kisses only bring germs to mind. We have the blessing of the resurrection when all things will be renewed. Give thanks unto the Lord this week for all the truth, all the grace, and all your blessings for Jesus is responsible. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God Almighty, you are responsible for the whole church. Grant us the firm conviction to proclaim the gospel of Christ throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. Christ is your eternal testimony that you have made a way to heaven, which is accessed and enjoyed by faith in him rather than by our own struggles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of all creation, you are responsible for all nations. May your word go forth and convert all the leaders who govern that they may acknowledge the authority of God in Christ Jesus and fulfill their duties according to his holy word. In the midst of all those calamities we have been prepared for, your people will reach out, help, assist, pray for the despairing, and indeed be a bright light in a dark place, drawing all unto Christ. May it be so with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great physician, you are responsible for those who are sick, hospitalized, injured, and enduring treatments. Especially we lift up Harold Moling, Bob Walden, Lisa Stonehawker, Eli Strutton, all caregivers, uh, Karen Collins, Marcy Clark, Dorothea Thorson, Janelle Goulet, Willie Mae Gherkin, and Evelyn Lyle. Grant an increase of wisdom and patience to their caregivers that all may firmly believe God's strength in the midst of weakness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Redeemer and Savior, you are the right hand of God and are responsible for all soldiers and first responders whose vocation is to place themselves in harm's way for others. Watch over them and protect them, that they may restore and keep the peace, giving hope to the hopeless and instill fear in the wicked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you give all things, pouring out blessings upon both the good and the evil. Therefore, you are responsible for the fruits of the earth. Grant faith to those who are harvesting the fields, that they may have patience work diligently and bring forth the abundant blessings you alone have provided. Bring to our state favorable weather, for we who worship and rejoice today, may all of our hearts be gladdened as we receive the good gifts from you. Now into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to share some announcements with you. We have a couple of birthdays this week. Laverne Green on the 15th and Gwendolyn Widener Widener on the 19th. You might want to send them a little card or text uh, on this special occasion. Also, um, our live nativity is coming up on the uh, December the 3rd from 6 to 8.30. We've got uh, uh, a few names up there, but we need at least nine, if not 10. So please uh, do that and be a part of it. It's exciting. We'll have hot chocolate afterwards. Also, um, I need a coordinator for caroling to our shut-ins. I most likely will be recovering from surgery. I know you don't believe that I'll ever get that done, but I will. And so I need somebody that's going to just kind of get those few names and routes and and gather people together. The material's all done. That's not a problem. And uh, so please sign up on the main bulletin board uh, for that. Also, just a great uh, happy day for Scott and Renee Martin. They have been able to uh, buy a home uh, just this last week. And so we rejoice with them in that blessing from God. Well, I want to close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And please, if you're not able to uh, come in person next week, then join us again on YouTube for the last Sunday of the Church Year Series B. After that, we'll be beginning our Advent season. God bless.